My name is Alan Burt, and welcome to The Commerce Lab, the show for growth-minded e-commerce entrepreneurs who want to scale their business. After having worked with dozens of successful brands through my firm, Blue Stout, I've been fortunate enough to see what it takes to successfully scale a physical products business into the eight figures and beyond. On this show, we'll dive deep into the e-commerce economy to analyze the cutting edge strategies of today's top performing brands and the industry leaders who are engineering their growth. If you want actionable advice and tactics you can implement into your business today, then keep listening. If you want to join a mastermind of other entrepreneurs and leading brand owners, then join us in the Commerce Lab official community on Facebook or visit thecommercelab.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome to our second episode of The Commerce Lab. And in today's show, we're going to be covering a topic that every successful entrepreneur, is, regardless of whether or not you're in the e-commerce space or not, has to overcome. And that's hitting your very first million in revenue. Now, specifically as an e-commerce entrepreneur, that first million is a pretty critical milestone for a few reasons. The first is it shows product market fit at scale specifically. So if you've been able to go out, build a physical product, sell it, and drive a million in revenue on an annual basis, that shows that you've been able to at least at a certain amount of scale, find that product market fit for what you are selling. Then the second very obvious benefit of hitting that first million is going to be you're going to be able to start to pull out some of that needed profit and capital that you can use to reinvest in inventory and your push towards that next milestone, whether that be five, 10, 12, 20 million, et cetera. And then finally, if you're looking to raise capital, it's a it's a critical milestone to help you garner a higher valuation. It's gonna be something that your investors are gonna be looking to see as a milestone to show product market fit. And then it's also a milestone you're gonna to wanna to show in order to help garner a higher valuation point for the business when you go out to raise that money. So what we've done today is we've pulled together two very separate conversations with two extraordinary founders that I've had over the last year and those two founders are Nate Checkets of Roan Apparel and Dave Heath of Bombas Socks. Now, if you haven't heard of either of these guys or either of these brands and you've been living under a rock because they've been absolutely crushing it, um, especially in the direct-to-consumer apparel industry. Both these guys sell apparel products, direct-to-consumer, online, and they've seen some incredible success over the last five years. So what we have today are some snippets of conversations with both of them where they're breaking down specifically the tactics and the strategies that they used when they were going and hitting their first million in revenue. So we're going to start off the show today with a conversation with Nate from Roan. And Roan is a essentially a premium activewear brand, much like you would see from like a brand like a Lululemon, except um, it has a specific focus on performance, especially for what they call the modern man. So without further ado, I'm going to open this up to Nate Checkets of Roan Apparel on hitting his first million. So it really started with um, you know the, almost the exact premise that you just laid out. My uh, I'll never forget my brother-in-law was like, "Do you think we can make you know kind of better quality product?" And my my feeling because the, you know I had I've, I've done a couple startups before. I'm like, we can make anything. You know, it's a question of whether or not we want to pay for it and what the margins are going to be. Making it is not the difficult process. I mean, certainly you've got your supply chain and like driving efficiencies with, uh, with margin and kind of, you know, consolidating shipments and, you know, freight. I, I don't want to say that it's easy, but it's relatively, you know, you can do it. The, the bigger question is, can you sell it? And can you build a community of people that really believe in the product and, and can buy it? And, you know, I really bought into uh, one of the things that Tim Ferriss teaches in his books is like, build a thousand loyal fans, mm -hmm. like focus on that. And I think one of the challenges that e-commerce and the internet has brought us is that we start thinking big too quickly and we forget about the blocking and tackling of just going and getting a thousand loyal fans. And when you look at retailers for you know, the last uh, 2000 years, it's about building relationships with people. And um, thankfully, you know, between me and my co-founders, we come from big families and we have lots of first cousins and we have um, friends that we've kept in touch with. And, and so 
we started by just putting a splash page up and saying something's coming, sign up here for email updates. And then, uh, then we started telling every person we could get to listen to us to go and sign up. And, um, and, and that really came to me because one of my good friends is, uh, is a guy named Sean Nelson. He runs a company called Love Sack. And Sean's story is cool because he won uh, a show in the early 2000s called Rebel Billionaire. And, um, and Sarah uh, Blakely, by the way, the founder of Spanx, came in second mm-hmm. in that show. And when I was starting the company, Sean said to me, Nate, you have to wear the T-shirt of your company. He's like, literally, obviously, you're making shirts you've got to wear, but you've got to be proud of what you're doing. And it's amazing how many entrepreneurs um, don't do that. They're like, you know, they're almost embarrassed. They're a little, they don't want to be self-promotional and mm-hmm. nobody wants to be the guy who's always talking about their company, but you kind of have to get over that. And so we would hold kind of challenges between me and, and, and uh, my brother-in-law. And, and then we had added a third co-founder later where we would say, let's see who can get the most emails this week. And, um, and then when we launched, we kind of launched this, built-in database. I think we had accumulated 5,000 uh, emails. And then it was just a lot of blocking and tackling from there and going out and, and talking to people. And then our first real hit came. Um, we got featured in the Wall Street Journal. And, um, and that was kind of uh, the, the rocket fuel that, that, that took us to the next level. And did you guys get featured in the journal by hiring a PR firm to go out and get that for you? Or did you guys do that by building a relationship with, with the journalist there? Or how did you get that first big win? Uh, it, was, it was through one of our um, investors. Uh, we had actually, he wasn't an investor. Uh, he became an investor after the article. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> Um, uh, but he, we, we met this guy and he said, I, um, I heard about what you're doing. I love the product. He had ordered some product and he said, I actually know, um, some of the editorial staff at the wall street journal. Uh, and I can't promise anything, but I'd like to get you introduced. And we had been talking to PR firms at that time. And, you know, we've actually hired and fired three different <laughs> PR firms and all of the best coverage has come from inside the organization, just Mm -hmm. from people like this. Mm -hmm. So he made the introduction, we started talking to them and, uh, and, and they decided to run a story on it in the off duty section, um, of the paper, which converts really, really well. And, and, uh, and yeah, we were, we were thrilled with the article, the way it came out and it was a lot of fun. That's fantastic. Yeah. That first big win is not only just, a, not only just momentum for the company, but also just momentum for, for the founders, right? To say, okay, this is, this is yeah. working, right? It's all about those little wins and little milestones and adding them up along the way. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. It's, it, it's like working, doing a startup, it, it's hard to explain to people if you've never gone through it, but it almost elongates your your highs and your lows, like (laughs) your ability to feel joy and happiness and excitement is like maximized and your ability to feel like despair and disappointment and like depression is, it's like also deepened. And I can't imagine going back and working in like a straight corporate environment. Now I'm like almost ruined because I have friends who work for big companies and they're like, Oh, and then this happened. And I'm like, it's not really that big of a deal. And they're like, but this happened. I'm like, that's not really all that great either. Right. You know, it's just like it, yeah. So I don't, I don't know. It's, um, it's, there's a, there's a positive and, um, and a negative there. I, I, uh, I completely agree. And I think every entrepreneur would also agree with that. So let's, I want to circle back around to that in a second, but, but before let's, so it sounds like getting to that first million was, was really just, just straight hustle, right? It was going out there and I love the premise of the, you know, I think what, what Tim Ferriss calls the thousand true fans or, or, or something along that lines. And it's, it's absolutely correct. Um, and so that mm-hmm. was the premise and you went out and you just hustled and you got that first big wall street journal win and you got to the first million. And, and I think getting to that first million is just that it takes literally just whatever it takes, whatever you have to do to do it, right. you get there. So, and, and I think not to, and not to make that a, you know, a light accomplishment, but I think a lot of companies get there. And then the real challenge is, yeah. okay, now that you're there, how do you actually build a real brand? Like, how do you take this right. really to market and get to that next $10 million, $50 million, $100 million mark? So 
And you guys have seen some great success on that road already. So what what have you done uh, post that million dollar mark to really put the gas on scale? And what channels are you utilizing to grow the brand now? Yeah, so a huge part of that was building up the infrastructure of the team and bringing in really talented people. I mean, mm-hmm. we were probably on track to do about a half a million dollars in sales before we were really before we really hired a first full-time employee. Wow. And part of that was because we were we were outsourcing just about everything in the early days. We had a third-party logistics provider that was handling the packaging and we were working with a product agency to kind of help us design and manufacture the products. And, um, and, you know, it just, it allowed us to be nimble and scalable and like, you know, not, um, not, not so focused on like, uh, losing and making money. It was just trying to get a proof of concept to see if what we were doing was, would really scale and work. And, um, and, and so once we, once we kind of looked at each other and we're like, we think this is actually going to work and this is a real company and, you know, decided to go into it with both feet, so to speak, from a hiring standpoint, it was really about going and finding people that were, would be just really, really committed to the company and would buy into the vision of what we were doing. And, you know, in the early days, you, you want generalists, you want people who will just work their absolute tails off with you because, and, and, and feel as committed to your vision as, as you do. And kind of, as you, as you start to scale, you start to hire specialists. And, um, it's kind of that interesting transition between generalists and specialists. And so now, you know, find people who are very good at a specific skill set and, you know, our first real specific skill set that we hired was um, somebody in, in, in digital media and customer acquisition. And, um, and we, we found uh, a guy at Priceline who was really, really great at driving customer acquisition and email marketing and just understood, understood the game, I think. And, and so for us to kind of get to that next big hurdle um, you know, that you, that you mentioned and kind of, you hear a lot in the industry, 10 to 12 million, that took a lot of, um, a lot of going and hiring the right people and being really specific about who we wanted. Now, my next conversation is with Dave Heath of Bombas Socks. And if you haven't heard of Bombas, they tout themselves as literally the most comfortable socks in the history of feet. And it's literally their tagline. And as Dave, who's the co-founder and CEO, explains, it was a concept that was developed after he learned that socks were the number one most requested item in homeless shelters. And it was this learning that drove both him as well as his co-founders to, when they launched Bombas, build into it a buy one, give one campaign, where for every pair of socks purchased on Bombas, they then donate another pair to somebody in need. And this buy one, give one campaign concept was something that was developed by Warby Parker, at least popularized by Warby Parker. Bombas adopted it and then used it as one of their early core tenets that helped drive a lot of their early PR success. It helped them get onto shows like Shark Tank uh, and things like that, which was a huge contributor to their early success and hitting that first million in revenue. And so what we'll do now is um, we'll give you guys and show you guys the conversation that I had with Dave, where he broke down very specifically the strategies and the processes that they used in their sort of journey, I should say, to hit their first million in revenue at Bombas. So without further ado, here is Dave Heath from Bombas Socks. Let's break it down into segments. So to go from zero to a million, what was the strategy? Did you guys did you guys have a all you know, word a, of mouth? Really, it was entirely I mean, viral. The, 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 the first the first the first million dollars, I should say, the first nine hundred thousand, mm-hmm. um, you know, came in the first thirteen months of the business uh, because there was a there was a really pivotal point at, at that thirteen month time, which I'll get into after. But um, yeah, it was all organic. I mean, we didn't have we we hadn't raised any capital. Um, we we really just wanted to see like can the product speak for itself. And, you know, I think we had certain advantages, obviously coming out of the media business, we knew a lot of people in media. Um, so we got a lot of free press, um, mm-hmm. from our friends, um, you know, we featured in GQ 
Penguin, uh, Uncrate, and uh, you know, Cosmo, and a lot of great publications. Okay. We were on so much the PR Today Show and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, we got a lot of PR. Um, but you know, I also think that the product also spoke for itself, and we had people coming back and you know repurchasing within the first three months, and you know giving a lot of gifts out to their friends, and uh, so there was a kind of an organic virality to it, which again was important for us to prove out as a proof of that next phase of proof of concept before we took any capital is does the product speak for itself? You know, does it, could this grow on its own uh, without us having to dump a whole lot into mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Okay. So you guys didn't do in those first nine months or 13 months, it sounds like you didn't do any, any paid media. It was all a combination of PR None. plus just viral growth and repeat buying. Correct. Okay. So that's, so that got you essentially to a million, which is in and of itself, you know, a, a pivotal you know milestone. Then what happened after that? How did you guys tackle the, you know, the $1 million to $5 million range? So we were really fortunate. Um, Shark Tank reached out to us that summer mm-hmm. uh, of 2014. Uh, they ended up casting us. Uh, our episode ended up airing uh, on the season premiere that year. So in late August, uh, in late September of 14. Um, and the, the exposure on the show just was like gasoline on a small fire. Okay. Um, we ended up doing... 1.2 million in the two months that followed the show, uh, leading up to holiday, uh, at which point we completely sold out of every piece of inventory that we had. That's incredible. Uh, so by December of, you know, before Christmas, we had sold out everything. Um, so that was obviously an incredibly fortunate, uh, you know, moment for the company. Uh, but I think, you know, the, while, while charting was definitely a pivotal moment and it certainly helped us kind of leapfrog probably by a year. Uh, I think the difference between, you know, I think the successful companies that go on shark tank, like anybody who goes on shark tank will see a bump. Mm-hmm. It's whether you have the infrastructure or strategy in place to capitalize on that momentum and build right. upon it. Are you capturing email addresses? Are you retargeting those people? Are mm-hmm. you inviting them to do pre-order when the product is not there? Are you giving them an incentive to come back at a later point in time? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's really having kind of that digital strategy in place uh, that I think is the difference between people who see a pop and then go right back down and the people yep. who see a pop and continue to ride that wave going forward. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Cause this is something we preach all day long to all of our clients is, is making sure they get the right systems in place so that when traffic comes, cause in the, the day, you know, e-commerce sites convert anywhere from, you know, two to five, you know, even up towards a 10% if you're really lucky, but they're, you're still losing well over 90% of folks that come for that first time. They're not going to make a purchase on that right. first visit. Right. So I'd be, I'd be yeah. really curious to hear in more detail. What did you guys do, you know, precisely to to put into place, or what kind of systems did you guys put into place prior to Shark Tank to make sure you had a residual effect from that traffic? You know, even if ninety plus percent of them didn't want to buy after coming to checking you out. Yeah, I think the first thing that I always tell people is if you're not if you're not finding a way to capture email and and really focusing you know, in the early days on less on, on the overall site conversion, but the conversion of capturing the email. Mm -hmm. So using, you know, I think we were using a system at the time called bounce exchange. Um, you know, but since then there have been a lot of other people that have come out and there's ways to do it, you know, natively in certain platforms like Shopify and stuff. Um, if you're if you're not capturing email on the first visit for for first time customers, then you are leaving a tremendous amount of revenue on the table. Yes. Um, so you know, and and thankfully again, like we had that in place because our website ended up crashing a bunch of times, and so having those emails was almost like a fail safe. So get a bunch of people come in. I think we were, we were capturing about 30% of all people coming in. Uh, we were capturing their email address because we were giving them some sort of an incentive off their first purchase. At the mm-hmm. time we were doing 20% off your first mm-hmm. purchase. Um, we, when our site went down, you know, we had that hosted on a separate HTML page. So we were still capturing all those emails before they were even hitting the site. And so once our site was fixed, it wasn't like we lost all that traffic. We actually had all those people. Now we just needed to find a, a way to re-engage with them. So let's talk about, okay, so then, so million to five million, you know, was you've got the massive shark take bump. You guys are, are putting in the right systems in place that are that are really focused around email acquisition and then finding ways to then nurture those folks over time, either through retargeting, social, 
uh, you know, actual email drip sequences, et cetera, just keeping them engaged yep. and building that relationship with them. And it, which I'm assuming w- it was a, a massive piece of growth from one to five and then, and then beyond what, how did sort of the marketing strategy change after, you know, call it 5 million. So looking on the last more so year, uh, a little bit more, what, what have you guys done differently? What, what have been your most profitable channels or what have you guys, you know, gone after with the most, um, sort of the most force in terms of scaling the brand? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, our, our strategy from kind of, I would call it 2 million, um, and, and on, uh, when we really kind of started spending, uh, real money on, on marketing, um, really hasn't changed all that much. Right. It's, you know, it's the analogy that in the beginning, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're mining for gold. So I always tell people too. one of the other pieces of advice that I give people is as soon as you go out and raise, um, you know, some capital, uh, and let's say you've allocated a few hundred thousand dollars for the year, uh, towards marketing, like, spend almost all of it in the first quarter. Um, because you know, marketing, digital marketing online, it's a stats game, right? Mm-hmm. Statistics. It's, you know, you're, you're going to get statistical significancy over a thousand customers. And whether those thousand customers come in in one month or they come in over 10 months, the, the results are probably going to be the same. Right. Um, so you might as well find out early on what's working and what's not. And I had this really weird revelation where, you know, I was like, we just closed a million dollars of seed funding and, you know, we had allocated $400,000 over the course of, you know, all of 2014. Uh, and, you know, we just hired this amazing rock star customer acquisition person who cost us $150,000 a year. Um, you know, and I'm going, why, why don't we just spend all 400,000 in the first quarter? Because if this doesn't work, then I don't want to pay her salary for 12 months. You know, I want to, <laughs> right. I want to pivot our strategy and go into wholesale or do yeah, something right. else. Cause if the metrics don't work online and, and you realize that at first it's, it's frightening, right? You're spending a lot in channels that aren't giving you a return back, but mm-hmm. you have to kind of spend that stuff up front to, you know, it's like mining for gold. You have to dig a lot of mines before you figure out like, you know, where the, where the gold's going to come from. Mm -hmm. And then once you do, then you can go deep into that mine and extract a ton of value. Um, but you know, so that's, that's always been our strategy is right. Is we're like constantly like dumping money into the channels that are working and, you know, the biggest channel for us. And not surprisingly, I think for most people these days is Facebook. I think Mm -hmm. about 70% of our spend is coming from Facebook. Mm -hmm. Um, We're finding Taboola to be really good, Taboola and Outbrain, the content remarketing Hmm. podcasts have been very good for us. Um, Sponsoring podcasts? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like live reads and, uh, just running ads and in, in podcasts and, you know, podcast is, is almost always like mining for gold. You'll use one that works for a few months and then it'll stop working hmm. and then you'll get one that works for two weeks and then it'll stop working and then you can revisit them and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. So that one tends to be a little bit more fickle. You know, I would tell everybody if they're going to start somewhere, start in Facebook because it has the most amount of transparency on data and you can mm-hmm. segment the audiences a bajillion different ways and mm-hmm. almost in real time see what the response is to a piece of creative, to a specific demographic. Um, but I also tell people don't spend money on any channel unless you really understand it. Right. Um, you know, it, you can end up losing a lot more through stupid mistakes and because you don't know how to run AB tests or you're not doing statistical analysis on cohorts and, you know, demographic splits, uh, which is why, again, I had no idea about any of that stuff. So I hired somebody who was, I, you know, a rock star in that area. Um, you know, pointless to spend a million dollars on marketing if you're not going to have somebody who's proficient in, in spending right. it. hundred percent. Hundred percent. So, and I think I think the podcasting piece is interesting because you're you're the second uh, entrepreneur we've interviewed on this podcast that's had incredible success with podcasts. And and the first guy was Kevin from Mizzen and Maine who sponsored the Tim Ferriss podcast. And he he calls yep. out the single greatest marketing decision they made um, in sort of the early stage of the businesses, and that's what launched them. Almost the same way Shark Tank launched you guys. You know, Tim Ferriss yep. sort of took them, put them on the map. Um, so it also goes to show. I don't know whether or not they they do that anymore, but it just goes to show too that you kind of have to you just have to throw it out there you just have to test stuff and then you double down on what works yep totally thanks for joining us on this episode of the commerce lab 
To connect with myself or the team here at Blue Stout, visit us at bluestout.com. To join a community of like-minded e-commerce entrepreneurs and other brand owners just like you, join the Commerce Lab official community on Facebook or visit us at thecommercelab.com.